And there's something else that people have been asking for for a long time, and I'm, I'm happy to be holding it in my hand. And before I butcher the explanation of exactly how the baffle works, why don't, why don't you tell us you know, what kind of additional versatility this is going to give people? This is the SPB40 baffle. It's a SP stands for spherical, B for baffle, 40 for the 40 millimeters that it is. It's made of a single piece of machine, Dalrin. Uh, this is made uh, by one of our shops in uh, Santa Cruz. Um, and it fits on the, um, the microphone in this way um, and stays there. This, this fit at the uh, junction of the microphone is very precisely tuned so that the acoustical surface coincides with the acoustical center of the microphone's operation so that it all integrates without any funny anomalies um, in the frequency response. This took several uh, months to figure out exactly um, how this interface should be done. Uh, a lot of people have again tried their own homemade approaches to it and they get close but they say gee this has a, some weird response artifacts don't uh, you know how can we get away from that and they don't take it the next step. The idea of a spherical baffle uh, has been used in microphones since the 30s in some um, the uh, ball and biscuit uh, dynamic microphone was always done this way to make it omnidirectional in all directions that in, in, in azimuth. Um, the, of course, the, probably the most famous of this uh, variety is the Neumann M50, which had a, uh, initially a similar uh, kind of capsule in a ball of ex exactly the same size. There are two reasons for this and why it continues to have uh, application today. One is that on axis, because of the pressure doubling of this surface, there's a little bit more of a high frequency rise on axis than would normally be. And that gives a little bit more focus, a little more brilliance uh, in the very highest ranges from 12 kilohertz up, uh, basically. We make the ball larger, it'll be effective to lower frequencies, but we don't really want that. Smaller, and it's really up there with the bats and not particularly interesting. The other, um, so that allows the microphone to be um, more focused in the high frequency direction, in the high frequency uh, region. The other important aspect is that anytime you have a uh, cylindrical microphone, it will have a hot spot, it will have a uh, response toward the front that has a high frequency boost. And as you change to off axis, it will roll off some more. Uh, having this be a spherical surface means that as the azimuth changes, the roll-off is more gradual and more uniform as it goes around. Uh, so you have the shadowing from the back that's more, uh, low fr more high frequency roll-off toward the back and a more gradual variation in high frequency response. So in many cases, particularly in the distant field, uh, like in an orchestral recording where M50s were first used. Yes, it's omnidirectional, but there's more of a focus in the front, and the integration to the reverberant sound field is more uniform. Well, fantastic. And I guess between the Jekyllin uh, and the balls, <laughs> basically, uh, we're you're looking at a you know just a more flexible microphone package, but still retaining the. Um, that most detailed in the world <laughs> um, we hope so. classification. The, the Jekyllin disc is a whole separate recording technique. This Absolutely. It's called OSS disc, and he has some very strong opinions about how that's to be done. Uh, there is a little bit more leeway in, in manipulating the use of the Jekyllin disc than, than, he, would, than he would indicate, but that's <laughs> fine. It's, a good, it's an excellent place to begin. Um, that's one approach that has the, the microphones at a particular distance with a particular separation that's doing various things and it's in his paper which is on our website. The, uh, the balls are used typically in a, in a completely different um, environment. Typically you would use them in a, a standard decatry where you would normally have used an M50. Um, but there are, are cases where you'd want to use one by itself as a spot mic, where you just want a little bit more. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's certainly uh, we do a lot of acoustic guitar recordings, and you can see well why that would be uh, that little top end edge could could add some um, 
air and openness to the guitar that you wouldn't be able to achieve in a totally neutral uh, application. Your ears will be the judge of, of, uh, of what's right because you'll be able to, uh, to, uh, to hear the effect of each of those sorts of things. And we recommend that uh, if you're able, the, the challenge with any Omni recording, of course, is that it's much, much more sensitive to the effect of the room that you're in. There are some rooms where you just can't use Omnis. When you can use Omnis, it should be a 617. I agree completely. Well, thanks for taking the time with us. Sure. It's, it's always a pleasure. Happy to do it.